using open automation and using something that provides things via like MQTT from yeah. the controller yeah. to provide it to a common space where the data sits that can be pulled from the ERP system, the MES system, the CRM, the whatever systems you have going on yeah. to make sure that you can look at all that data and, and do the calculations um, via the metrics to, to really figure out what is truly needed to make sure you have the right amount of material coming in to go out the door so you're increasing your overall profitability. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at digital transformation consulting firm Elevate IQ. If you have been thinking about incorporating robotic processes or industry 4.0 controls into your facility, you will have a choice whether you would like to buy the control systems directly from the vendors or program the robotic arms and control systems until you get the desired results from the manufacturing process. Therefore, irrespective of whether you are a system integrator or the end consumer of the robotic process, you need to make a key decision whether you want to build the entire process from scratch or buy it out of the box. In today's episode, our guest Ira Sharp shares his insights on open automation and why that is important for manufacturers to understand as they increase the industry 4.0 maturity of their companies. He also describes the differences between open, industrial, and process automation. Finally, he discusses why it is important to understand the vendor lock while buying a control system produced by vendor versus having control over the processes by designing it from scratch. Let me introduce Ira to you. Ira Sharp is the Director of Product Marketing Automation at Phoenix Contact USA. Ira has over 15 years of experience in industrial automation with a focus on open control, IIoT, Industry 4.0, networking, and cybersecurity. Over the past few years, he has led marketing, engineering, and sales teams to run a multi-million dollar product portfolio. In addition, Ira has an active digital presence, most notably being the co-founder of the Industry 4.0 Club on Clubhouse. Ira was named a who's who for IIoT on the annual Onalytica report in 2020. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hey, Ira. Welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be here, Sam. Great to be here. Great to be here. Hey, and we have been waiting for this moment for a long time. We have been talking back and forth that, you know, which topic we should be covering. And here we are. Just to kick things off, Ira, do you want to start with your personal story and current focus? Yeah, sure. Sure, Sam. Um, so again, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's a great opportunity to be chatting with you here. And uh, so personally, I'm uh, a director of automation for marketing, marketing um, automation at a company called Phoenix Contact that focuses on industrial electronics. Uh, uh-huh. Been with the company for actually 16 years. Oh, wow. That's a long uh, time. So, yeah. So got started there and uh, haven't been, of course, a director the entire time, kind of made my way through the ranks. Before I actually joined Phoenix, I came out of school and I started my own company, yeah. did my own thing for a little while and and really developing some things for the retail space, yeah. uh, really in, in a pricing scenario where wow. I focused on communications to digital displays to do pricing. Yeah, And I tried to get that off the ground. And that's when I learned my first real business thing where trying to start a company is really expensive and really hard. It is hard. And uh, <laughs> ultimately ran out of money and had to go get a, what I call a, a real job to help pay the bills as uh, as I was getting married and looking to start a family. And that's where I landed at Phoenix Contact. And it's been a great ride ever since. It's been a phenomenal opportunity. 
And uh, I've been afforded the opportunity to look at a lot of different types of industrial applications from process automation to factory automation to OEMs to end users, system integrators yeah. across the board. So, and uh, most recently here, I've been the director of automation for a number of years and have really been focusing on open automation and the IoT industry 4.0 space. Okay, amazing. And it's going to be super exciting to dig into all of that because obviously these things are super hot and everybody sort of trying to understand if this is really going to be meaningful for them uh, or not. So we'll have a lot of fun doing that. But before we do that, we have one of these standard questions that we ask every single guest, Ira. And that is going uh-huh. to be your perspective on business growth. Business growth? Uh, I mean, there's a lot going on. There's, I mean, especially with everything going on in the world right now with the pandemic, there's tons of opportunity out there. Of course, there's tons of challenges out there. There's, there's new things to consider. There's new ways of, of looking at things. And I always see those challenges, and I know it's a little bit of cliche, as uh, quite frankly, as opportunities. Yeah. Um, how can you take on the, the challenge to deliver things in a different way, provide information in a different way, do things in a different way yeah. to really further yourself, further your company, and really further the industry or technology as a whole to, to really make things good and better for the, for the longer haul. Because let's face it, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but we know yeah. where we are today. So you have to take that on head on yeah. and just really figure out how can you pivot? How can you make the best of it? And I think that's, that's where my head would be on terms of, of where the growth is. In terms of industry growth, when I look at the automation space, yeah. every, I feel like every time I go anywhere anymore, there's a shortage of workers. Uh, you know, yeah. Retailers are closing down early. It's hard to get fast food anymore. You can't even go inside some of the places. It's just through the drive through. It's it's hard. It's hard to get keep people employed. And I think that's happening in other industries as well, including manufacturing. So being able to automate more, to do more with less people, less physical resources there in-house is good. And improving production, improving quality, and, and improving what you can do without physical manpower is only going to excel things. So I think there's a a lot of opportunity and growth in automation. um, And then in the space of open automation and of course, uh, industry 4.0 and IoT. Yeah, completely agree, especially your comment about pivoting and being agile, uh, you know, overall with respect to your business model. That's where uh, you have tons of opportunities. Also agree that, you know, there is going to be a little bit of shortage of workers, even though I like to call it as the shortage of qualified workers, as opposed to just the workers, because you have tons of people looking for jobs, you have tons of employers who are also hiring a lot, but the matchmaking is a problem just because the skill set is not there. So obviously the automation is a great solution, but even that is going to require a lot of skill set. It's not easy to automate unless you have really figured out and, and, and making the sensible steps that are going to be required in any sort of automation. So now let's talk about you. Uh, uh, you know, you mentioned three different words or keywords for that matter. Number one is the process automation. Number two is the industrial automation. And then you also mentioned the open automation. So let's mm-hmm. say if my listeners are not really familiar or familiar with these terms and they want to understand what it would mean to them. I don't know if you're going to have any specific story of a manufacturer that you might be able to pick just as as an example so that these guys can relate, maybe describe the business model, describe the different products, what kind of factory they have, and describe where process automation, industrial automation, and the open automation would make sense for them. Yeah, that's a good question. And it's a good distinction. So, uh, of course, there's many different ways you can describe these things and you can look up online and there's yeah. different verbiage. But but here's the way that I would define it really short and sweet. Process automation is exactly that. It's a process. Okay. It's a continuous operation to make uh, a product in the end. And one of the easiest things to think about from a process perspective is like food and beverage or oil and gas uh, where something starts off, say, as a potato, right? Yeah. And Frito-Lay takes it and they cut up that potato. Or they maybe peel the potato. They put the potato in a fryer. That potato goes into a bag. That bag gets some air in it and it gets yeah. sealed up and it 
goes out the door. And that's a continuous process that's going. Yeah. So that's process automation. Or in oil and gas, maybe you're extracting oil from the ground. That oil goes into a truck. That truck gets sent to a refinery. The refinery takes it and splits it up and does what it needs to do. And it becomes gasoline and goes to a gas station. Yeah. It's a continuous process that's yeah. happening. That's very different than, say, like a, a can manufacturer that maybe gets um, some, some raw material that comes in and it separates the raw material, it presses it, and makes cans. I mean, it's a bit of a process, but yeah. it's, it's considered a discrete process versus a continuous process. If you yeah. turn off the, the can system, there's not like a liquid flow or these, this continuous application or this continuous process of material that could potentially be damaged if the process is shut down. Yeah. So it's continuous processes versus just a, kind of like a, a start and stop or, or factory automation type of process, manufacturing process that exists. So that's kind of the difference between like the process automation and industrial automation or 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 factory automation environment. Okay. And all and both of those are under the guidance of when I say automation, I live in the world of industrial automation all the time. So my head immediately goes to things like automotive manufacturing and big companies like Exxon and yeah. you know, Frito-Lay and these kind of companies of making all this stuff, but it could be just as simple as the automation at your house, like yeah. if you have a Nest thermostat yeah. or you have a security system, like that's automation too. What's going on with your doors and, and all those kind of things. It's basically taking data, using that data to make things happen, turn off yeah. and on your heat or run a, run a manufacturing facility. Now, the other thing, Sam, that you mentioned, which is near and dear to my heart and one of the big topics I'd like to unpack here, because when you talk about growth, I think this yeah. is one of the biggest areas of growth is open automation. Yeah. And open automation is is really something kind of layered on top of everything that I spoke about. It doesn't really matter what industry, whether it's the process, the factory automation, or even the home automation. The open automation is the idea of not using what's considered the standard systems for the control. So when you look at industrial automation, yeah. there's a standard, and uh, I'm going to drop some letters and numbers here. It's IEC 61131. Okay? okay, that's a standard that's traditionally used in a manufacturing environment. Now, don't get lost in what the letters are. It's basically like saying, hey, there's a programming language. It's not a language, yeah. but let's just say it's a language for, for our purposes here yeah. that is used to program in to make a system work. And everybody uses the same basic language. And the reason that's done is so that if you're looking for employees to program it, yeah. they all kind of know roughly the same type of language that's happening there. Yeah. Open automation widens that scope a little bit because okay. the reason that's important is years ago when automation first became a big thing, there wasn't, everybody didn't learn programming in school. People weren't coming out of school with knowing how to program in things like Python or C or C++, or I have four kids, right? They all have tablets, you know, they're yeah. digital natives. The world is very different today than it was in the 80s, yeah. 70s, where people didn't have the, 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 the same skill set in terms of programming that they have today. So open automation allows you to not only program in those traditional ways, but yeah. also leverage new ways of programming as well. So if you happen to know things like Python, which is a programming language, it's a yeah. very popular one, or C or C Sharp or any of those languages, you can use any of those language to make a system or process work rather than only using the standard. So you can use the standard yeah. or you can open yourself up to do a lot more and and that really provides you to do more than you traditionally could do and it also allows you to use a wider skill set because you spoke about it earlier finding the skilled worker somebody that can actually perform the job that we yeah. just spoke about earlier it, it gives you a wider sample of who you can pull from to come in and work on these systems and 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 and, and make an application work so it it, it gives you a wider skill set and it allows the systems to be more dynamic and unique. Yeah, so very interesting perspective. So I am going to recap some of the things that you mentioned so that we are aligned with our expectations. So number one, you know, we spoke about the process automation. So obviously in your case, you described the process more from the manufacturing perspective. The second one was also the factory automation, but that was slightly more discrete process. The first one was a slightly more continuous process. If you look at the financial executives, for example, you know, my listeners, they must be a little confused because for, for, for them, the process is going to be, hey, order to cash process, you know, because that's mm -hmm. the business process that they are looking at, right? Because they need to 
take care of that as well, right? So there are going to be many different processes that they need to automate. That automation is equally relevant, but this is obviously, you know, this is going to be more of the manufacturing process automation. Now, let's talk about the open automation. So you mentioned the open automation. I personally grew up as the digital native, to be honest. I have been programming for last 20, 25 years, okay? Right now, the problem that I see in the community, obviously, I completely understand the problem that you mentioned with the IAC, uh, you know, 611.31, and I don't know how closed these systems are, that you may not have access to the code, or they might be proprietary, they might be guarded by the vendors, so you are opening it up. But in my case, when I look at any of the programming or the programming assets, Typically for a CFO, that's going to be a big liability. They need to think about everything from your cybersecurity to who's going to maintain it, what's going to be my risk, how expensive these developers are going to be. So even though the frameworks are going to be free, but when you look at from the CFO perspective, you need to look at the entire life cycle. I'll give you one more example. If you compare this with manufacturing, now you could have a person who is able to manufacture something in the garage, okay? This is just a guy, you know, who has figured out how to produce the hardware. And this is the similar comparison when you are going to compare with the programmer who have figured out this language in their school. But when you look at the formalized manufacturing process, okay, there are going to be a lot of things that you need to do to make sure these products are going to be safe. They are going to be secure. They are going to be consumable. Right? The same thing applies for the software development as well. When you have to formalize the software development, when you have to produce a product that other people can consume, that requires a lot of investment in planning, in doing the, the right documentation that is going to be required for everybody that is going to be consuming the software. So now let's go back to your comment about the open automation. So I get the pitch about open automation that you know it's not going to be vendor guarded. But overall, what were the challenges in the guarded system? Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? And maybe if you have a little bit more story about what were the business challenges for the business that can be resolved by open automation? Yeah, so really good points. And, and when you look at everything you just mentioned there, Sam, I, I, there, there's a lot to unpack. Yeah. And, and when you look at it from a transactional perspective, a CFO perspective, the money flow perspective, yeah. there's raw material, there's processing, and then there's ultimately what you're selling it for, and then there's the, the, the roll-up of that. So the automation piece of that doesn't directly impact it. But here's the thing. Other elements that come into your, your cash flow yeah. is going to be the inventory that you have. Yeah. It's going to be the scrap that you 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 get on a on a factory floor. I don't care which type of process it is. Yeah. You know, how much scrap do you have? But it also gets your your operators and how much they're they're actually working and and producing, you know, yeah. and not just not just quantity, but quality and how it all results together because you could have the best operator in the world that turns out the most number of widgets that you possibly have. Yeah. You could have a scrap rate that's out of control that's costing you way more than his production. Yeah. So what's going on in your in your process? What's going on in your facility? Those are all the questions that you need to be asking because that's something that in it, it, it that open automation can really enable because open automation can be a replacement for your existing control system or it can be an add-on. This can also dovetail into the industry 4.0 and IOT piece, but that's some of the advantage of the open automation piece is it, it can give you both. It can give you the control and also do this data exchange. Because if I'm on the finance side of this and I'm looking at my overall operations, I'm looking at how I can increase profitability and yeah. my quality and all these aspects. And getting the data metrics and truly metrics, not just the sensor data, yeah. but the metrics of, of what my yields are and all those kinds of things is going to be critically important. But here's the also the other piece is then tying those into my business systems so that my my uh, procurement system for my materials, my raw materials, yeah. is ordering at the right interval based on how my production is going and my quality is going and everything else. Yeah. So, so it's it's a little bit of the just-in-time inventory. And I really am a strong believer in just-in-time inventory, but it's really got to be just-in-time, like legitimately just-in-time, 
not, hey, I typically produce this much stuff, so I need to order this many materials. It's yeah. no, the material has this type of long lead time. That lead time is variable. I'm going to produce this amount of materials. I have this type of forecast. It's tying all those business systems together yeah. to truly understand how much inventory I need to be ordering at what interval to have it be just in time for my operation. Yeah. And the only way to really know that is to have a completely closed ecosystem to know what my forecast is, what is my sales numbers, what am I producing, what are yeah. my yields, what can I tweak in that factory floor, what do I have here coming in, and what are those production time or what are those lead times looking like, and changing all those knobs almost dynamically to give you the correct amount that you need to be saving. So, and I know that's a lot of things that I think are probably typically discussed on this type of of uh, the podcast here. Yeah. But the idea here is using open automation and using something and I'm going to get tech here in a minute is, you know, that, that provides things via like MQTT from yep. the controller yeah. to provide it to a common space where the data sits that can be pulled from the ERP system, the MES system, the CRM, the whatever systems you have going on yeah. to, to make sure that you can look at all that data and, and do the calculations um, via the metrics to, to really figure out what is truly needed to make sure you have the right amount of material coming in to go out the door. So you're increasing your overall profitability. Does that make sense? It does. But I mean, I'm actually going to break it down for my CFO and the CEO listeners so that they can follow it along. So if okay. you actually, if, if I am acting like my, my listener, then obviously they have always known the business systems because they needed that to close their books, to do their accounting. So they always had, you know, some sort of accounting system, some sort of inventory system. Then they figured out, you know what, I probably need some sort of scheduling system as well. Uh, so that's what the whole e ERP ecosystem was, right? So they might have this ERP system, but obviously the limitations of the ERP system is going to be that you are not going to have real-time connectivity with your machines. They are probably going to have, and some companies do you utilize MES system, which is going to be your manufacturing execution system. Now, I don't know the protocol that you mentioned. I need to know a little bit more about that. It does, is that going to be more at the PLC level? So, so let's say if I have my, my MES system that is capable of talking to these controllers and the PLC in real time, if they can do that and I can bridge this data to my ERP system, where is open automation is going to be relevant here. Is it that, let's say, if you don't want to utilize off-the-shelf MES system, you want to create an MES system, then open automation is going to be relevant? Or are you going to use open automation in conjunction with, with, with your MES system? Yes, the second one. So here would be the thing. Yeah. The reason open automation is important is because then you're not vendor locked. So you have an MES system today, you have yeah. a CRM of your choice, you have, uh, you know, whatever, you have all these different business systems. Yeah. If you ever go to change your business system, it's, it's a huge pain. Nobody wants to do it, right? Companies make huge livings off of changing businesses, the SAP and vice versa. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's a major, major thing. So having a common space that is non-vendor descript is key because then everything else becomes modular and you can really plug and play what you want to do the different analytical pieces to connect to that data. The other thing is this, by having a common space yeah. where you send all of the data, because you mentioned, and don't give me, a, don't, don't let me get away without your, or not answering your question about the, the personnel and, and maintaining these systems yeah, either. Yeah. But when you talk about a PLC, yeah, you can talk real time to the controller on the factory floor of the PLC. You could also talk to the sensor. But what are you getting? If you're just getting the data variable of, hey, the machine is running or not running, that's nice. Yeah. But what about when, what is it running? Is it not running? Is When was the last time it was maintained? Who's the operator? You know, what is the exact information that's coming here? What sensors are there? What are the tag names? When was the last time they were maintained? What, what was the, what's the set points on all those? Having all those variables. Do you need all that information as your audience? Yeah. Probably not. But what if you do eventually? What if you correlate somewhere down the line that having your sensor not calibrated every six months increases your scrap yield? And the only way you could find that out is by tracking it in the centralized place where all of a sudden you have that data where you can start doing the analytics to figure out, okay, well, maybe that was a problem. Maybe it isn't a problem. And then you you have the, the, the ability to pick the information that's right for you as the CFO and your engineering manager can have the information that's right from them from the same data pool, just different variables, as well as the CEO can look at different variables as well from the same data set. 
That way it's one common space that all the data is in and you can pull the data that's appropriate for you and what you want to look at. Does somebody need to build those dashboards and make use of that information? Absolutely. Is that another challenge in itself? Absolutely. That's probably a whole nother episode. The point is, it's there. It's very much like, and sorry, I'm a little bit of an analogy guy, but I think of the NFL. Yeah. You look at the NFL and helmet to helmet collisions are no longer allowed, right? Yeah. And uh, it's it's a penalty now. But how? why did they do that? Well, if you go back in time, I mean, helmet to helmet collisions were like the centerpiece of Monday Night Football with the two helmets literally coming together. Yeah. And it was a big thing. But they found by collecting data from a large sample set of NFL players and seeing the long-term effects of concussions of them over time to see that it truly was a problem. Everybody speculated. Everybody kind of knew, but they were able to prove it out. And by doing it, they were able to make adjustments in the system, in the game, to make sure that that happens less often now. And that's why you have these these changes in the game. You can say what you want about if they're good or they're bad, but it's no different than in a process any process, any manufacturing system, any system at all. Yeah. You take data, you evaluate it long enough, you create a baseline, you make adjustments to improve the system to have a better output, to yeah. have a better outcome for the products. Make sense? Yeah, it does. And I am going to address some of the points that you mentioned from the CFO's perspective again. So let's talk about the, the vendor lock. Obviously, any sophisticated financial executive, they want to reduce as much risk as possible from the vendor perspective. But we as the manufacturing executives also know that, you know what, we cannot run our businesses if we are not working with the right vendors. So having the right mix of vendors is equally important in the manufacturing business. Also, the manufacturing business is not really your software business. So the more risk you can offload to your vendors, the easier life the manufacturing companies are going to have because your core business model is to produce the products, not to build the software, okay? So now when you say vendor lock, so let's talk about vendor lock, okay? So even if you are, let's say, if you're not, locking the vendor from the programming perspective, you are still going to have vendor lock with, I don't know, if you are utilizing that, let's say if you are hosting this data on Microsoft Azure, uh, you are going to cloud. You are going to have vendor lock with with Microsoft. You are going to have vendor lock with so many different vendors in the equation. Um, You are going to use uh, use some sort of ERP system unless you are writing everything from scratch, (laughs) which Mm -hmm. is which could be a massive lift. It, it could cost billions of dollars and there is no guarantee that it's probably going to be successful. So, so now tell me why vendor lock is so critical here for open automation that my financial executives should be considering open automation as opposed to worrying about the vendor lock when vendor lock is always going to be relevant irrespective of the path that, that I choose. You don't want to do everything completely ground up, you know, writing ones and zeros on a processor? Come on. No, I'm just kidding. We, we should be doing that, man. I mean, that, we should be going. I'm kidding. I'm back. kidding. No, bad idea. Bad idea. So you're absolutely right. And there, there's an element of risk there. But when, it, when I look at this and, and there's the vendor lock point, it, it can be good and bad. It's a double-edged sword. But uh, I'll, I'll give you an example, and then I'll then I'll try to unpack yeah. it. In the process world, particularly okay. the oil and gas world, it's not just the oil and gas world, but there's a thing called a DCS, which is decentralized control system, DCS. Okay. And it's really a when you look at what that is, it's kind of a combination. It, it really reduces the most risk as possible as a manufacturer because, yeah. you know, the really big oil and gas companies they don't want to have to worry about control systems. They just want to buy a system and they want to work and they want to bring in oil this side and have gasoline come on the other side and be done with it. Right. Just like you said. So you go and you buy a DCS system from a big company and you pay a lot of money for it. And it's kind of the PLC, the controller and the software and and everything are kind of all built into one. Yeah. Makes it easy. Yeah. But you're stuck. You're stuck in that house for 30 years until you change out that system, which isn't bad. But when you think about technology and where it was 30 years ago, what could be done? What could be computed? What what is available? How granular could you get? How much how much yield can you get out of your production based on a progr- programmatic sequence that was done that long ago? It's not going to change. You're stuck in that technology for that amount of time. So there is a risk there's there's a there's a risk in terms of moving towards the future with too much vendor lock. Yeah. So Exxon Mobil, and I know that's a big company, but, yeah. but hear me out here for a second. Yeah. They sponsored a technology project with a company, Lockheed Martin. 
big yeah. engineering firm, yeah. could just see one thing. They did it for one reason. They said, hey, is it possible to run one of our facilities without using a big name DCS company? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they wanted to do it with Raspberry Pis and open source software. So yeah. exactly like you said. Yeah. And they successfully did it. And what they were able to do is run a process reliably yeah. using Raspberry Pis as an open open controller and a and an open control system. Now they didn't write everything from scratch. It was there was a technology that existed. There was software that was out there. It was supported. Yeah. But it it's kind of like running Windows. Like you can yeah. run Windows on an IBM PC. You can run it on an HP PC. You can run yeah. it on you know whatever PC. It's kind yeah. of like installing Windows on a computer. They just needed a different, they needed a universal vehicle, universal computer to run it on, an industrial computer, yeah. and a universal software that supported the same type of functionality as a traditional DCS system. Yeah. So it's not writing necessarily everything from the ground up, but it's using things that are a little bit more vanilla, you could say, so that you're not stuck to just this box and only stuck to what that vendor has. You can be over here in this universal world. And today, it's still evolving. But that's moved to an organization that's actually pushing that called the Open Group. Yeah. And the Open Group is now creating a set of standards for open-based control yeah. based on an open architecture control system and yeah. software system. And there's a brand new startup that just happened. The startup is called COPA, yeah. which is a coordination between CPI and Seaplane, two different companies, CPI yeah. and Seaplane, where they're basically making a control system for people to do test beds. And you have big companies now that are using these test beds, using this, this open process automation system yeah. that I spoke about to see if they can truly do process control reliably and effectively using open source code or the software, basically, and, and hardware. Yeah. Um, so that's that's an idea of how it can uh, all work together in a real life application. Started with a big company with a big research firm to do a technology project, but it's now actually being used on many beta sites around the world to prove it out. And and there's a new startup that's happened to to really help sponsor it. So maybe there are new business models in, the, in this as well. That's another yeah. big thing. But the financial incentive is to be able to use new technologies to your instrumentation, you know, and, and, and to get more information about those sensors, kind of going back to what I said in the, in the beginning of more data gives you more variables. So you can tweak your process and have more information of what's going on. So you can create better yield, lower scrap and better quality um, ongoing, which ultimately creates a higher financial incentive for any company. Okay. Amazing insights here. So let's talk about, you know, these vendors a little bit more. And I don't know if you are able to provide some sort of examples of who these vendors are. And you mentioned that, you know what, you might be locked in for 30 years on a specific technology. Now, as a financial executive, I need to know all of my financial risks. So one thing I am not going to be able to do this is, let's say, if I, and I don't know if this is going to be Rockwell or Siemens or Ellen Berzies of the world, if those are the vendors and I'm locking myself with those vendors, then anytime, you know, I have problem in my process, in the manufacturing process, and that is actually driving everything for me, I need to call them up and they need to come and they need to fix my problem in my facility. Now, that's a big deal for me. But can I find these guys somewhere else in the market? Let's say if I want to develop my internal capability, do I need to go through the training? Do I need to have my guys go through the same training from the vendor so that they can get educated themselves uh, on the process? Is that the risk that you are talking about from the from the vendor perspective? So do you want to paint some more colors overall, yeah. you know, who these vendors are and why are we locking uh, themselves up with these vendors and what are going to be the implications? Let's say if I lock myself up, for 30 years, what am I going to lose? What am I going to gain? Yeah. So the, the 30 year example was more of a DCS example yeah. where you actually do buy something from the vendor. So someone like an Emerson or a Honeywell or Yokogawa, yeah. you know, that's going to sell you a really big DCS system for your process system. Yeah. When you look at Siemens, Rockwell, Schneider, they, they can do some in that process space, but it's a little different. Yeah. You don't typically buy those products directly from those companies. You buy okay. it from integrators. Okay. Or if you're, or if you're a manufacturer, um, it depends on who you are in this whole grand scheme of things, because there's end users, there's OEMs, system integrators, machine builders. There's lots of different people. There's lots of different players in this space here. Yeah. But if you're an end user, you're you're a manufacturing facility, you're yeah. making something, you're going to buy a piece of a capital equipment. You're buying a piece of capital equipment, right? Yeah. You're buying a conveyor. You're buying a robot. You're buying a whatever. You're, you're most likely going to also hire an integrator to get that done for you, to integrate yeah. it. Yeah. So it's not Rockwell, it's not Siemens, it's not Schneider. You're yeah. you're 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 hiring the 
the local integrator to, to do it. So that's who you're calling to, to service it and maintain it. So your, your element of lock-in there is a little less on the on that discrete side and PLC side. It's more on the DCS side because you're okay. buying, you know, an Emerson system and that's going to be, that's what it is. And, and it's going to work really well for you. And it's got a ton of technology built into it. And it's fantastic yeah. Yeah. because it's really great at doing what it's doing, but you're always stuck in this box. So if there's any advancements that happen, you're probably not going to get it out of this box because you're, you're stuck in a box. On the manufacturing side that I spoke about with the PLC, the integrator. Yeah. The reason I say that is your lock-in is kind of with the integrator. Okay. As long as you can find another integrator that can do that. There's lots of Rockwell. There's lots of Siemens. There's lots of Schneider. There's lots of these integrators out there that can work on those particular control systems. Yeah. I truly believe there will be a growing integration base of more open base type things that maybe use uh, like a code assist or, you know, PLC next is, is, is something that's a little bit more open based that it can, can work on different types of platforms. And then you look at the data side of things, yeah, the data manipulation, which is really where a lot of our conversation is centered around of getting the MQTT is the protocol I mentioned. There's other yeah. protocols that can do getting to a common data set, that new integrator, that data integrator, that doesn't need to look at a, it doesn't matter if it's a Siemens or Rockwell or Schneider or any of these other things. It's all about, are you, be able, are you able to produce that kind of data to that space or to something, some sort of database? In a lot of cases, those traditional control systems cannot do that. So you want to look for something that can do that so you can, you can have the, the data you need to be able to move your product forward. And the integrator that's going to make it all happen, yeah. first you're going to hire to glue it all together, he needs to have that expertise. Okay, very interesting. So let me see if I understand this. So number one, you mentioned that, you know what, you are probably not going to have as much problem on the discrete side, the more problem is going to be on the process side of things. And these are going to be, as you mentioned, these are going to be oil and gas companies. These are going to be, you know, probably food and beverage companies that might not have as much discrete process. They are going to have slightly more continuous process. So if we look at the process side of the things, so what is the real difference between the control system and you seem to be referring the term called DCS, right? So how is DCS different on the process side versus the discrete side? Do you want to talk about the, the underlying technology a little bit uh, in terms of what are the real differences? Well, I mean, we can get deep into that if you'd like. I mean, but really at the end of the day, it, it's 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 a closed box system. So okay. when you look at a PLC, yeah. any PLC, yeah. you, buy, you buy a PLC. A PLC is nothing more than a computer that's industrial and yeah. can connect sensors to it, right? Yeah. So you buy a PLC, it can do whatever you want. You can yeah. attach a visualization screen to it. You don't have yeah. to attach a visualization screen to it. You can deck it to a screen. There's lots of different things you can do. It's more a la carte, yeah. where a DCS is... You uh you know you bought the car or the the PLC you bought the wheels you bought the engine yeah. you, know, you buy the individual pieces and you kind of piece together the car yeah so that's why on a, on a PLC side of things you typically hire an integrator to do it on the DCS side of things a lot of cases you can you can do re integrators or or, or partners yeah. but in a lot of cases you're dealing more directly with the manufacturer or the the vendor of of that particular control system um but but don't get me wrong like there can be definitely an element of vendor lock and control systems on the discrete side as well. Okay. It just happens at the integrator level. And here's the thing, if you, makes perfect sense, especially from a CFO standpoint, if yeah. you hired, if you if you have three maintenance people on staff to run your your manufacturing facility and they all know RS Logics and you have all Rockwell, yeah. you changing out Rockwell for something else is crazy because you have a, a, a long-standing staff of people that can service all those products at a moment's yeah. notice and downtime is 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 as dollars lost. So the quicker you can get that up and running, the better. So you, you do have to look at that. And, and what I'm saying is in terms of open automation, it doesn't mean you need to flip the switch and go completely open automation tomorrow. It yeah. can work its way in. So if you're, if you have a team of people that are trained on a particular platform, yeah, continue to do it. But if you're not able to get the data of everything else I spoke about, that's yeah. where you can add in this element of open automation. And then once you get the person or, or hire someone in to, to help you with that data manipulation, that can work its way down to open up the rest of it as well. So it's, it's not an all or nothing thing. It can okay. grow with you. Okay. It's, it's, not, it's not a full stop in, in this scenario. 
Okay, very interesting. So again, I am going to do a walkthrough uh, to make sure that you know my listeners are able to follow along. So in case of DCS, you mentioned that that's probably going to be a black box. In case of your discrete uh, processes, you're probably going to have individual PLCs and you're going to have far more control. So I am still struggling to understand the whole concept of DCS. So let's say if I'm the oil and gas company. So here I am working with Honeywell or Emerson, you mentioned, right? So are they going to ship the whole control box where individual PLCs are going to be housed and I am not going to have access to any of those PLCs. I am simply going to have access to the, the box. And the only thing I, I know is the input and output. I'm not going to have the access to the individual control system. Can you describe more? Yeah. So so really what it would, would get down to is more of the the, the way it's programmed. Okay. So it's 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 just going to provide you more widgets out of the box to make sure that you can do the things that you need to do in a traditional process yeah. very, very easily in a DCS system. That's what you're paying a lot for. So not only you have the control system married up to the IO, married up to the visualization system with all the details. So again, as, as a manufacturer, as a CFO, as a whatever, you can get your system going quickly and it's very reliable because there's other people that are using the same exact same programming. When you're over here in PLC world, you get a PLC, you turn on the PLC. Guess what the PLC does? Nothing because you didn't tell it what to do yet, right? You have to go in and you have to write the, the logic. You have to use the, the ladder logic or whatever else to really program it to figure out what it's going to You have to do it on the DCS too, yeah. but you're not necessarily starting from scratch where there are a lot bigger library of things that you can pull in to actually control a continuous process okay. as, as blocks and variables and these kind of things on a DCS side versus a PLC side. It, when, when you look at open automation, it's, it's an overarching architecture. It has a big trend towards opening up the number of people that can work on traditional systems. Yeah. So you're not stuck to just the, the very limited number of people that can program in that language of 61131, which is an RS logics or a TIA portal or whatever platform you happen to be using in your manufacturing facility. Maybe you can then look at people that can program in Python, or yeah. what if you look at people that can program in C? There are more people that can program in those languages than in a traditional language. There is more risk in it because it's not as rigid, yeah. but you can you can augment that risk by combining the two pieces. The idea here is that looking forward, there's an element of being able to do more than you could traditionally do in your control system. Yeah. And you need to you need to really look at the risk, the financial risk, the liability of the the control system. And you mentioned security and personnel. I think we got to most of the personnel pieces, but security is another piece here. All those risks associate with with this topic, but I'm seeing more and more in control systems, people popping a Raspberry Pi in them. And when you look at a Raspberry Pi in a control system, why was it added? Well, in a lot of cases it was added yeah. because you just needed to collect some data. You needed to do some sort of simple operation that the PLC couldn't do. Yeah. Maybe you have a vision system and you need to run a little script to say, hey, is that right or wrong or whatever else? Like maybe you add a Raspberry Pi to do that. Well, Raspberry Pi is not industrial. It yeah. can very easily be vulnerable because you don't know what Linux operating systems on it. Yeah. Who is who is maintaining it? Is it even on the book? Like there's there's a laundry list of things you need to look at. Yeah. Bottom line is it's not an industrial component. You can put an industrial box. The company I work for makes them. You know, we 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 can make it make it look more industrial. But an industrial control system that's open can offer the same capabilities as a Raspberry Pi while providing the hardness, rug, ruggedness, and reliability that you would expect as a manufacturer so that you can have the openness, but still have security to the core through manufacturing processes. You can still have reliability in terms of, of temperature spec and those kind of things to make sure it'll work and shock and vibe and, 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 and other things on a factory floor. Okay, amazing, Ira. So that's it for today. Do you have any last minute closing thoughts or remarks for our listeners? The one thing that, that I really like to challenge everybody to really look at when you look at any control system, yeah. I don't care if it's a lock system or anything else we talked about, is ask yourself, what is your control system not doing for you today that you wish it did? And quite frankly, if it's doing everything that you wish it could, don't change anything at all. But if you wish it gave you a little this or a little that, or you wish that you knew a little bit more of what's going on with your operators, or there's some answer to the question of what is my control system not doing for me today that you wish it did, maybe have a look at what open automation can offer. So with that, that's all I have. Okay, amazing. And my personal takeaway from this episode is going to be, there is always going to be a decision making how you want to structure your business processes. So make an informed decision based on 
your current environment and what you are trying to accomplish. Each of these options could be equally powerful for your facility, whether you are going with the open or automation path or the other path, but make sure you understand your financial risks with each of the option and what is going to be most meaningful for you. On that note, I really want to thank you for your time, Ira. This has been a powerful episode. Thank you very much, Sam. I appreciate it. And I wish everybody out there a really great day. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Ira, connect and follow him on LinkedIn. His LinkedIn handle is Ira Sharp Jr. It's I-R-A-S-H-A-R-P-J-R. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with David Schultz, who shares his insights into how manufacturers can increase the capacity from their existing investments by connecting them in real time. Also, the interview with Tom Harrop from Splunk, who shares his insights into the core reasons for the organizational divide between IT and OT. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.